Welcome to another episode of The Advocate. Today we're going to be talking about debtor and creditor law. We have two attorneys who practice here in New Mexico. Uh, we have Gerald Velarde, who is a bankruptcy attorney, and we have Donald Fenstermacher, who uh, represents uh, creditors generally. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Welcome today. Uh, thank you for having us. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. Uh, Jerry, tell us a little bit about your practice. What do you do? I'm uh, primarily a uh, represent consumers in bankruptcy cases. I do do some small business reorganizations, Chapter 11 reorganizations, but primarily it's representing consumers in either Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 uh, consumer bankruptcies. Okay. And Don, tell us a little bit about your practice. I currently work for a bank as in-house counsel and uh, in that work and my prior work, I've represented people who are trying to get money back from debtors. All right. So tell us a little bit about the, uh, the creditor practice. What are the types of issues that come up most frequently? Uh, typically, the core problem is just an inability to pay. Um, people get into hard times or situations either through their own choices or, or bad circumstances. So that really is the primary issue is that they're not able to. What kind of advice would you give to a creditor, somebody that's considering loaning money to someone else, either a personal loan to a friend, a family member, uh, maybe even just an acquaintance? What type, of, what type of advice would you give to somebody in that situation? Well, having done this for many years, uh, I have occasionally had someone come to me in advance of loaning the money, but usually after. And the advice I typically give is, if a person is unable to get a loan from a bank, and banks want to loan money, and they're in the business, they have the expertise, and they can take the risk, if a bank won't loan somebody money, you ought to think really hard about whether you should. Okay, and so that's good practical advice, but you know there are some situations where you know the person, you feel like you can trust the person, um, and so the loan's gonna take place, what type of advice would you give in that situation? You would definitely want a document. You want a promissory note. It's a simple form, and you can probably just get a generic form somewhere that clearly outlines the terms. That's one of the common problems in a family or friend situation is that uh, people misunderstand or they, they are thinking of two different things about what is owed, how it will be paid back, and what the deadlines are. So a document is essential. Okay. Jerry, what do you think about that from a debtor standpoint? Good idea to have a document, not a good idea? No, it, it, from a debtor standpoint, yeah, you want to make sure you have a document uh, because there's always an issue of whether or not it was a gift or a loan. Uh, and secondly, to add to, to what Don was saying, you, if you can, get collateral. I mean, if they have a car that's free and clear, ask that they put, be given a lien on the car in order to secure the debt. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of acting against my client's interest, but that in terms of protecting the person that's loaning the money, that's the best way to do it is to get collateral. Um, now, there's a lot of objection generally to those types of situations. Why can't you trust me? Why don't you just loan me the money? Why do you need my car or my watch or my uh, jewelry or my furniture? I mean, uh, I, I suspect that uh, because of the types of cases that come before me in court, that there are some of those types of discussions. What, what do you think about that? A lot of discussions like that. What I see a lot in bankruptcy cases, and I represent people around the state, and especially in the Four Corners area, is uh, that children go and ask parents to either co-sign a loan or to loan them money or to use their credit card or to co-sign on a credit card with them. And of course, that always turns into a nightmare for the, for the parent because the child sometimes is sometimes can be irresponsible. I mean, I have three of them, and more, luckily mine are fairly responsible, but the a lot of clients that I see, their children are not quite as responsible, and so the, when the car loan is not paid, the parent has to pay it. When the credit card bill comes pay, uh, to be paid and the child cannot pay it, then the parent has to pay it or is responsible. Quite honestly, I see a lot of that, in, especially in the Four Corners area, that contribute to bankruptcy filings. Well, and you know, what I see most often is a parent co-signing a lease agreement. Uh, so the parent's actually not occupying the property. Uh, their uh, adult uh, child is, uh, and so the parent signs on behalf of the adult child and also becomes equally responsible for the debt, which kind of brings us to a pretty interesting, I guess, legal theory or, or term, joint and several liability. Don, what does that mean? 
That means that each person is separately liable for the entire debt, and it's a really good thing to talk about in this discussion about co-signing because people need to understand when they co-sign, they are agreeing to be jointly and severally liable. That means they are liable just as much as the other person, and even if the creditor doesn't go after the other person. So uh, when you're asked to co-sign, you're not being asked to approve that a loan is being made. You're ask, being asked to pay the loan if there's a problem. All right, and uh, what I see joint and several liability happening quite a bit are when uh, someone might go co-sign on a bond. Uh, someone is in jail and they're trying to get them out of jail and they're asked, the parent or the family member is asked to co-sign on that. A lot of times they, they th the, the individual thinks, I just have to assure that they get to court. Uh, Jerry, what do you think? I'm not a criminal law person, but I would assume that if the person doesn't go to court and the bond's forfeited, that, that person's, the person that guaranteed the loan is going to be equally responsible. Uh, you know, another area, Judge, that, uh, we, that I see it a lot that causes problems is student loans. Uh, student, you know, parents are very, they're probably the most where you guarantee a student loan just so that the child can go to school. And the parent has to realize that if that student loan is not paid, they're going to go after them. The, the parent and that can be not a small sixteen thousand dollar you know car but perhaps a you know a hundred thousand dollar student loan that's been taken out for the, get a, a degree in, in uh, language arts so what kind what kind of advice would you give to to borrowers uh, you know in, in those types of situations quite honestly my advice is to don't do it uh, you know the, as an initial instance but then realizing that you're a parent and the parents are going to do it uh, be very cognizant of how much you're guaranteeing and whether you have the ability to pay it back. Pretty hard to ask for collateral from your own children. Nah, it's impossible. Right. I mean, so you, you certainly want them to get the education uh, and you don't want to be the reason why they can't afford to get the education. But I guess, so the best advice is just be careful. Yes. Be careful. All right. Uh, let's talk about some other creditor debtor types of situations. What, what do you see most often uh, in the type of work that you do, Don? Uh, typically, a lot of uh, real estate loans, uh, personal loans, lines of credit, and things like that. Um, one area that's very popular is home equity loans. People need to realize that if they're borrowing on the additional equity of, in their house, they are putting their house at risk for that. And a lot of times people don't really think about that again, that they are, they are putting up collateral and the lender wants the collateral because it's a way to get repaid if something goes wrong. So that's something to be very aware of. That uh, do you want to jeopardize your house if you can't pay this loan back? Okay, and when you say jeopardize your house and put your house at risk, uh, what is the consequence? What does that mean? The consequence is foreclosure, losing the house in a foreclosure, um, particularly somebody who already has their house uh, paid down or, or paid off and then goes back and takes money out uh, by borrowing against the house. That, that takes from a situation where the house is owned free and clear to where once again it can be uh, it could be foreclosed and taken back and that's particularly a risk as people get older toward retirement where they really don't want to have that continued expense of a mortgage or the risk of losing the property. And what's the most common or typical types of situations that you encounter, Jerry, in your practice? In terms of bankruptcy, uh, the causes of bankruptcy are, are usually uh, losses, of, uh, losses of income uh, through either reductions in overtime, loss of a job, going through uh, a divorce. Um, I, I very rarely, and I've been, I, Don and I have been doing this for a long time against, well, with each other, I can't say against each other, but with each other, because we, we, we found that it's really a, a, an effort to try to work out a solution. There's a limited amount of money, and you're trying to work out a solution. But, y you know, it's, it's just that people overextend themselves, and I, I see it very, very rarely where they overextend themselves on purpose, that they go buying golf clubs or trips to Hawaii or whatever. What you usually see is, like I said, an ability to make payments at a particular point in time, and then that point, that, that circumstance changes to where there's maybe only one that's able to service the debt because of a divorce or a loss of a job, uh, and, and so they can't afford it anymore. Now, uh, I understand that the state bar actually uh, offers a debt counseling type of service. Uh, I think it's once a month. Uh, if anybody's interested, they can contact the state bar. Right. 
uh, and uh, you, there are lawyers there that are available and have a discussion with regard to how to manage debt or what other options are available. What are the options that are available with regard to debt? If you, if you owe an amount and something has happened in your life, uh, perhaps something tragic, you know, a death in the family or medical expense unforeseen or an accident or a loss of a job, uh, what, what options are available? Uh, there's about four that I can see. The, the first one is to try to negotiate with the creditor. Um, creditors, uh, by and large, are going to try to negotiate a deal. I know in dealing with Don and, and his bank, you know, they're, they're willing to do something in order to avoid that loan going into default. Uh, secondly, they don't have to do anything, and then they can just have creditors pursue them and exercise creditor remedies, which include garnishment of wages and whatever. And we'll talk about that in just yeah. a bit. The, the two bankruptcy options are Chapter 7 and Chapter 13. Uh, chapter 7 is a straight bankruptcy. We refer to it as a straight bankruptcy where you just uh, get rid of all of your unsecured debt and any deficiencies on any secured debt that you may have that you elect to give up. The second type of bankruptcy is Chapter 13, which is a consumer reorganization and an attempt by that uh, debtor to pay a portion or all of the debt back to the creditors. Uh, there are some tests that determine whether or not which one you qualify for, and there are tests which determine how much you can uh, pay back to creditors. But as a general rule, in this state anyway, most people qualify for Chapter 7, and the only reason you would want to file Chapter 13 is if you want to save a house because you can pay house arrears over a period of five years in a Chapter 13 plan. You can refinance cars in a Chapter 13. Uh, Don was talking about uh, HELOCs, home equity loans. And in, in certain instances, you can actually strip off uh, second mortgages on homes in a, in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy. All right. So, uh, Don, uh, what kind of advice would you give to a debtor uh, with regards to, uh, Jerry had just mentioned, you know, call the creditor, see whether or not you can negotiate something. Uh, from, from your type of practice, uh, would you recommend something like that? I absolutely agree with that advice. Um, like any problem, a financial problem does not go away if you ignore it. And the best thing to do is to be in communication with that lender when you're having trouble and stay com in communication. Um, you are dealing with people and if they simply can't talk to you and can't ever reach you or you don't respond, they pretty much are going to decide to step it up to the next level which may be suing you. If you communicate what's going on, what the problem is, what you think you can be able to do, that makes a really big difference. Okay, and so let's talk a little bit about that next level, suing somebody. Uh, how, does that, how does that process begin? What, w tell us a little bit about it. Typically when in a bank or a, a large lender there's a collections department. There are people that start dealing with your loan after it becomes past due after it becomes a problem. And uh, when they give up, they decide to send it over to a legal department or a lawyer, an uh, inside lawyer or an outside lawyer, who prepares a lawsuit and files it in your court or an appropriate court somewhere in the state. And the lawsuit basically says that someone owes the money, they didn't pay it back, they've defaulted, and uh, the creditor is seeking a judgment which gives them legal remedies to try to collect sort of by force, by using extra tools. And you know what I notice uh, that's particularly interesting is that in those types of situations where uh, someone may owe some money, or at least that's the allegation, that a lot of times debtors come into court and they believe that the defense is, I can't pay it, uh, you know, I just can't afford to pay it, and that somehow that's going to excuse the debt. Um, Jerry, thoughts about that? I wish that were the case. I have a lot of debt. I'd like to get rid of it. <laughs> we'd, all, we'd all have a lot of debt, right, that we'd, we'd get rid of. No, when you sign on the, on the dotted line, either by borrowing money on a credit card or signing a note with Don's Bank and buying a car, uh, especially a Lamborghini, uh, you're going to have to pay for it. And, and if you, if you, you need to plan ahead. And there are changes that happen in life, divorces, changes in income, but, you know, you shouldn't incur debt unless you think you know that you have the ability to pay it back. Okay. And so if, if somebody has taken it to the next level and has filed a lawsuit against, against you or the debtor, uh, what, what should happen? Well, the, the, the problem is usually the creditor is going to come in and usually the creditor is going to have their ducks in a row. And they're going to have the notes and they're going to have the account statements and whatever. And your honor is going to enter a judgment against, that cre against the debtor. The failure to, or inability to pay is not a defense. Um, 
And then what the creditor is going to do typically is probably try to garnish wages. And, and that's allowed in this state. And you can garnish up to 25% of a debtor's wages, but not take them below minimum wage. And that hurts, you know, that even makes the situation even worse with regard to the other debts that they, the, the debtor may owe and putting food on the table for the family. Yeah, and we're going to get into that garnishment process here in just a bit. But you know what I think is generally a pretty good idea for debtors, and this is along the lines that you gentlemen have just talked about, is, is communicate, discuss it with, the, with your creditor. Uh, that if you've been sued, uh, you have a right to file an answer. Uh, file an answer. Uh, the, the judge or the court will schedule a hearing and it will bring the creditor and debtor together, which is an opportunity to now discuss it to see whether or not perhaps there's a way to work out an arrangement if there's no defense. If you have some sort of defense, you know, statute of limitations, it's just too long or uh, some other type of defense, you're certainly welcome to raise those defenses and there will be a trial to address those types of defenses. But at the very least, if you file an answer and then you appear at a hearing, it gives you the opportunity to discuss it with each other and perhaps work it out. So uh, let's talk about the garnishment process, okay? So uh, the creditor is taken to the next level. They file the lawsuit. Uh, the debtor has either answered or not answered. Uh, there may have been a trial or there may be a judgment entered either at the trial or as a result of default because the, the, the debtor failed to respond. So there's a default. There's a judgment that says debtor owes creditor X amount of money. What can creditor do to try to collect that money? Well, garnishment is one of the most powerful tools, and when I referred earlier to uh, using the force of the law to collect, garnishment is, is the most powerful tool. One thing people need to remember and think about while they're filling out that loan application or co-signing is the lender is getting a lot of information about you, and they want to know what you own, your assets, as well as where you work. And one of the reasons to know where you work is if things go bad, they can garnish and the process is after the court has ruled and entered a judgment for the creditor, the creditor can apply to the court for a writ of garnishment and a writ is an order to the employer to have a certain amount of the paycheck sent to the creditor and again as Jerry said there are some limits they can't take 100% of your check but for most people losing 25% of their paycheck would be a very significant problem and it's very effective for a creditor a as a tool. And that's the law generally uh, for most uh, commercial debt or consumer debt. Uh, if there's a garnishment in place and they're garnishing your employer, it's 25% of your take-home pay. Uh, and the law does not allow a judge the discretion to reduce that amount, certainly cannot increase that amount, and so it's 25% of the take-home pay unless the debtor and creditor work something out. If they work out some sort of payment arrangement, then that's, that's appropriate or can be done. But if they're not able to work something out, then it's 25% of the take-home pay. Are there any defenses to the garnishment, Jerry, that you're aware of? No. Okay. I don't, I don't think there are either. You know, a lot of people, especially wage garnishment, uh, people think that some of it will be exempt, uh, that there's, uh, because they don't have enough money or they don't have enough to pay their bills or other bills, that somehow the, the, the judge or the court has the ability to, uh, to modify that or reduce that. And, and declare that some of it is, is exempt. And uh, with regard to wage garnishment, nothing is exempt. Uh, so it's 25% of your take-home pay unless you work something out with the creditor. Now, there's another type of garnishment. Uh, you can also garnish other property or other things. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, Judge, and that's a, a very important thing to us as a bank on both sides of it. Uh, garnishment means collecting from a third party. So money due to the debtor from a third party, whether it's wages or a bank account. And so again, when you applied for that loan and sought the credit, uh, you typically list where you have accounts or perhaps you simply make payments with a check from a, from a bank. Um, the creditor can also ask the court to issue a writ of garnishment to your bank, telling the bank that if it has money for you that it needs to hold it to pay that garnishment. And that also can create a lot of problems for people. Uh, they ex the garnishment writ is effective when it's served on the bank, so the bank has to hold the money immediately, even if your rent is due the next day or the rent check you wrote the previous day won't clear. So that's another powerful collection tool, which is part of garnishment. And how much of the account is the creditor entitled to, to garnish if it's a bank? 100%, up to the limit of their judgment. One other uh, collector uh, collection act uh, method used by creditors that I'm finding much more effective recently is abstracting the judgment. 
and having it filed of record in the counties where you think that the debtor is going to own property, which attaches a lien to any property that's owned by the debtor. It means that what the debtor says, well, maybe I'm, I can do something and sell my house and pull out the equity, and then when they go to close the transaction, there's a, a transcript uh, of judgment that has to be paid as part of the closing process. So and we'll talk about transcript of judgment yeah. because that's a different yeah. type of collection process, and there's essentially three or four uh, procedures that creditors are allowed to follow. So let's follow up with the with the or finish up with the, the garnishment process. Okay, they can garnish on anything. So they can garnish 100% up to the amount of the judgment, right. but there are some uh, amounts that can be exempt. When it's when you're dealing with the bank account, Don. Yes, Judge. Uh, and, and there are, there are several. There are a whole bunch, and probably too many to go over here today. But highlight some of them for us. I've got the two most important ones. And again, I work for a bank, so I see both sides of this. When we get garnished, um, even when it's not money due to us, it's money from a credit card company. There are two important protections in the law, and one is if you receive Social Security or certain types of payments like that. The bank is required to review your account, and this is new as of the past several years, but the bank has to look, and those deposits from Social Security, for example, are coded a certain way. So you do have some automatic protection, and you should be aware of that because sometimes a bank might overlook that. So that's one protection, uh, benefit payments. And the other is joint accounts, and there's some, again, past number of years, some case law in New Mexico that it used to be that if you had a joint account with somebody and they had a, a, a judgment against them, the, uh, the account could be garnished. Now there's a question when it's a joint account about the bank possibly having to determine who owns the money in the account and protect you. So those are the two big ones. Well, and it probably start with the bank first, but ultimately it would be a court that makes the determination if it is a joint account and, be, and the issue gets raised then the court would make the determination as to who owns what money in a joint account. And so there, there are some issues that come up like that. Uh, you identified uh, Social Security as one of the exempt pieces of property, but there are other exempt uh, cash or other exempt monies uh, that belong in a bank. Jerry? Uh, I think under New Mexico law, you have $500, $500 exemption, flat exemption per person. Uh, if you are in bankruptcy, there's another set of exemptions you can use, but as a collection device in state court, I think you get a $500 exemption. Yeah, and you also can declare exempt uh, disability payments, retirement payments, uh, any kind of government benefit type of payment. There's a whole host, there's a whole list, uh, and it's too many to go through here today, but there's a whole list of uh, types of funds or uh, cash assets, liquid assets, uh, that if they're in a bank account would be exempt from garnishment through that uh, through that process, okay. And now, Don, you had mentioned something pretty interesting. Garnishment really is going after a third person. So, if for some reason, as an example, you're the debtor and your neighbor is holding your horse, or is holding your jewelry, or holding some other item of property that uh, can be used to pay the debt, the creditor actually can go after that third person to try to collect those other items of property or cash. To, to try to get paid. Yes, uh, garnishment is generally collecting anything from a third party due to the debtor. Um, if, if the action is uh, directly against the debtor, one thing we haven't mentioned, with, which is probably worth a quick mention, is simply the creditor trying to get your own property from you if you're the debtor. And that is um, oddly named and very scary in that it's called execution, which means that a sheriff comes out to you, the person who owes the money, and says, I'm going to take some property uh, to satisfy that debt. But if the property is in the hands of your neighbor or a third party, it's garnishment. And that's generally the second or a, an alternative way to try to collect. It is called uh, a writ of execution or a writ of attachment. They have kind of, a, the, it's interchangeable. And essentially what happens is the creditor files an application and asks the sheriff to go out and take property that belongs to the debtor. Uh, that's not exempt, and again, there's a whole list of exemptions. Uh, one of them is the $500 per, uh, personal property exemption. There's also a homestead exemption. There's a whole list, a laundry list of, of those items. But uh, it's not also physical possessions. Let's say that a third party owes the debtor some money mm -hmm. and is making payments to the debtor. They can garnish the creditor to pay those, make those payments to the creditor, the garnishing creditor. 
That's right. And so there's, there's a couple of, of, of ways for creditors to go about that. It's garnishment and attachment or execution. And then, Jerry, you brought up a third way, which is filing a transcript of judgment in the county that uh, the creditor believes that the debtor owns real property. Right. If they own real estate in that county, then uh, through this transcript of judgment, there's a process that allows the creditor to foreclose on the real property. Right. And t but typically, they don't foreclose. What they do is wait for the, for the property to sell. And then when the property sells, they can make a claim against the, against the proceeds of the sale. And how does that typically happen? Tell us a little bit about that. So here, here the debtor uh, is getting ready to sell some property, and the closing is scheduled for a week or two away. And then all of a sudden, there's word from usually the title company, uh, we've got a problem. And so what, w describe that a little bit. What the problem is is that there is a transcript that needs to be satisfied. You know, there are other liens that have to, might have to be satisfied, such as tax liens and whatever, but if a creditor has filed a transcript, and typically they do, uh, typically they do then that, that has to be paid as part of the closing process from the, from the proceeds, so the debtor will not be getting that. I, I kind of hesitate because as a bankruptcy matter, usually I can avoid those transcripts of judgment in either Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 and get rid of them because it does something called impairing a, an exemption in, in bankruptcy. Um, and I'm not sure you can do that in state court. I don't think you can argue impairment of exemption uh, in state court. I don't think you can. And that, I will say just from the creditor perspective, I file a transcript of judgment in every single case where I get a judgment. Yeah. It's just a basic thing to do. And oftentimes people think, oh, I was sued and nothing happened. But what did happen, even if the creditor didn't do anything else, they usually filed that judgment lien. If you go to sell the house or even refinance sometimes, it will come up. And then the title company says, how much has to be paid? And it, it's a problem at that point. And it's a real problem in bankruptcy, too, just because, as Don described, they don't realize that that's one of the methods that is used to collect the judgment. So I file a bankruptcy. They tell me they owe, they, there's a judgment from the bank. You know, it's incumbent upon us to then go search the title records because if there has been an abstract filed, we have to file a motion to avoid or it doesn't go away in bankruptcy. It oh, stays with the property. And, and, and we're out of time, I notice. But uh, before we close, uh, the last thing probably debtors and creditors pro should understand is that a judgment is good for 14 years in New Mexico. That's essentially the statute of limitations. So a creditor can take action to try to collect uh, any time during the 14 years. There are some issues about uh, perhaps reinstating it after or uh, renewing it after seven years. Um, very technical, uh, but I think for the most part, the law is that the judgment's good for, for, for 14 years and a creditor can take action to try to collect during that period of time. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. I, uh, you know, I wish we had a little bit more time because there's certainly a lot more information that we could go through. Uh, I think for uh, debtors and creditors out there, uh, the best advice is if you're ever going to find yourself in that situation, you probably ought to consult with an attorney. Uh, before you incur the debt, uh, before you loan the money, uh, it's generally a pretty good idea to, to know your rights, know your responsibilities. And as always, God bless. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it.